I want to introduce somebody new to the team of Impact. You're going to, you're going to uh, meet some new people that we've added to our team. This gentleman is a powerhouse. Uh, he served on the board of Muslim Advocates. Uh, he worked in corporate law for several years. Um, he's taking a sabbatical, but has decided to uh, advise MPAC. He's our senior advisor for policy and strategy. Um, and uh, he's a remarkable person who has been by our side even before he joined our team. Please welcome Fayaz Hussain. Salam alaikum. Thank you, Salam, for that very warm introduction. Um, I can't see my notes. I can't see you all. I don't know how this is going to go, but we'll try. And then, as Salam said, I'm a lawyer, and they put me after a doctor, a pastor, and Salam to do fundraising tonight. So I don't know how, it's, how well it's going to go, but we'll try. Um, and on top of that, they gave me like five to seven minutes. Um, so I immediately thought of the, what in Chicago, I'm from Chicago, we call the, the Imam Shakedown where the imam says, we're going to raise 2.5, 2.6 million, I need seven hands, and, and everybody's even afraid to scratch their ear or nose because they're worried they're going to get committed. Anyway, let me get going because my time is short and they're going to cut me off. I already see I'm down to like seven here. All right, so I think that what I'm going to do is quite simply just tell you my personal journey and how I got to MPAC. I tend to talk fast, so I'll, I will slow down because I want to make sure I don't go by facts too fast. Um, but before I get there, I think I want to share my sort of background and, and, and uh, my family, et cetera, and kind of the emotions I went through uh, and how I got here. I was raised in, well, I, I lived in four countries across three continents. I was born in, the, in uh, Bombay in India. I was there until five, moved to Bahrain in the Middle East, an island in the Persian Gulf and then eventually came to the U.S. Uh, in high school. And I always felt there was something not quite right when I, when I lived overseas. I always felt like a second-class citizen. I always felt like an outsider. I remember in India where there were riots in Bombay and Hyderabad, where my family's from, and we were told not to go outside because they were hunting Muslims down and literally um, slaughtering them in the streets. Um, I remember the Sikh riots and what, what happened to them. And unfortunately, India and the Hindutva ideology is taking India right back to that state. We were, I was very relieved when we moved to Bahrain because it was a Muslim country. But that relief wore off very quickly because I realized that we were bullied by Bahraini boys. We were um, called Hada Hindi, Hada Miskeen. They constantly shouted at us as they were driving by for no reason. My, and worst of all, as a kid, when you see your parents not being able to speak up, that's the worst thing because they experienced racism, but they couldn't do anything about it. I'm getting to the better parts of the story. So I moved to the U.S. in high school, um, and I learned about the Declaration of Independence. And it said all men are created equal. And I can't read here because the lights are so bright and I don't have notes, but when I heard all men are created equal and they're endowed with certain unalienable rights by their creator, among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, I immediately was reminded of Prophet Rasulullah's last sermon and Islam, what people taught us, that in his last sermon, as you might remember, and I don't, please don't quote me exactly, but what he said was, all mankind are from Adam and Eve, no one has superiority over another, no Arab over a non-Arab, not a white person over a black person, Everyone is equal, except by piety and, and good action. That's the only thing that mattered. So for the first time in my life, when I learned about the Constitution, when I learned about what equal protection under the rights meant for everyone, I felt liberated. I felt ex ex exhilarating. I felt like I had arrived. I felt like, wow, this is what I knew was wrong all those years. And finally, the American dream, the American experiment, when I learned about it, I just fell in love with it. And I realized that I also learned about the challenge that Japanese Americans, African Americans, Jewish Americans, and they all faced and what they had to go through and the, the legacies that we are now writing their coattails. I learned about that as well. And it really made me realize that this is literally the country that we belong and, and, and are here as equal. And I remember the first time I was, I was probably only here about a year and a half, two years ago, 
when I was in the parking lot and some guy shouted out to me, I'm sure you all have heard this, I heard this many times, go back to where you came from. I looked at him and I said, are you Native American? And he said, what, what'd you say? I said, are you Native American? He said, no, I'm European. I'm like, then go back to where the hell you came from. The guy shut up, he muttered, and in that moment, I kind of realized that I can do that here without worrying about getting jailed or fired or whatever. And I rode that high all the way through the Clinton years, the Bush years, 9-11, even though we all felt just, it was, it was one of the most shocking events of our lives, but I still felt okay. Of course, through the Obama years, and that high crash came crashing down when in 2016, Trump was elected and the MAGA Republicans. So a man who said Islam hates us, a man who said there should be a total and complete shutdown on Muslims in America, come from coming to America, and he actually went through with it as we know. A man who also entertained the idea of a database, that's what happened to the Japanese Americans during World War II, as you all know. That man was elected to the highest office in the United States. I, I didn't care about people around me who, like they're, you know, they're ignorant or they're kind, I mean, not kind hearted, but they have good hearts, but they just don't know. And I had been blessed with a tremendous, um, just, just incredible stories which I don't have time to get into from the evangelical side, the left-leaning liberals in college. I've just been blessed in every which way. And in that moment, I immediately started feeling again like an outsider, like a second-class citizen. And I really worried about my kids. Um, it was a very emotional moment, almost like a personal 9-11. My wife and I are both lawyers. And we couldn't explain to our kids how that had happened. And that there were people here who said that my U.S. citizen, U.S.-born citizen kids were not fit to be president because they practiced Sharia? How dare they? But it was a very humbling, it was a very dispiriting time of my life again. Thankfully, in literally, I'd say a week after, I went to a khutbah at one of our local masjids, and the khatib was just, he made an incredible sermon, which, which turned me around, alhamdulillah, and I wanted to share that with you all. He reminded us that, Prophet peace be upon him said, that even if you are, even the appointed hour is upon us, and the day of judgment, you can see it literally on the horizon, and you're about to plant a sapling, a young tree, you're commanded to do it. That's the faith that we have. That's the hope that we have in our religion. That doesn't matter the odds, that is our duty. We make investments, we make, we plant trees, and we let, inshallah, Allah take care of what's going to happen. So that just turned me around. There was no way after that that I was going to go in and accept who was in power or whatever. And I realized I was handed a lot of my, my, my blessings in life by all the work the prior communities have done, the African-American community, Jewish rights, Jewish uh, civil Americans, civil, civil rights that the Jewish Americans have led. And I felt like I'd never really done anything to give back other than donate to organizations or, or do a little bit here and there. But I never had really earned my right. And I'm just talking about my own story. And so in that moment, I talked to my wife, had a lengthy discussion. I had come to the Impact um, Convention in 2019. I was really energized by the people, by you all, by the commitment that I saw here. People like Salam and his family who've dedicated 35 years of their lives to do work on our behalf. And I really felt like I needed to do more. I needed to take what I had learned in terms of my legal skills in the private sector, 20 years uh, of, of learning what, what best practices, if you will, and I wanted to try and channel that into the public sector. So I decided to take a corporate sabbatical, and I started looking at nonprofits. And MPAC um, clearly stood out. I'd been a donor, we'd been donors and supporters for many years. Um, but MPAC was very unique because MPAC makes investments um, years in advance um, and builds relationships, does things which enable good policy to take place as opposed to bad policy. We can always issue press releases. We can always sue government or when a bad law is passed, try to get it repealed. But that takes years and costs a ton. So the more investments we make up front, which is what MPAC does, I thought this is an organization. In fact, I heard Salam speak 20 years ago at ISNA and I was blown away by his, his thinking and his logic of what work MPAC did. And we've been off and on supporters ever since. So I talked to my wife again, said I'm gonna commit my wagon to MPAC. And one of the programs that Impact does, I'm, I'm 
whoa, I'm, I'm done, but give me just one minute, please. Um, MPAC has a CLDP program, which is a phenomenal investment. My own kid, Amar, graduated from there. Uh, for, well, it was a summer internship program. What they do is MPAC actually provides a summer stipend. It provides housing for some of the brightest kids in our country, Muslim kids, to have an exposure to, to the halls of Congress. The hope is that they then get elected in the future, or even if they end up in private sector careers, they'll give back to MPAC and our community. So sem we've had 77 people graduate from that program, and these are 77 of our brightest stars. So at the end of the day, I think that we all have to decide what kind of an investment are we going to make? And I know that many of you, if not all of you, have already pledged, you've already given, and we thank you for that, because without that, our work couldn't be done. I think we've, we're already at 100. 78,000 or so with pledges. We're trying to get to 250,000. But again, if you don't give tonight, give again. Give in the future. But do give. Let's figure out what can we be doing to help this great nation. And again, a lot of people's experience may not be as, as American pie as mine. But this is the best country. This is the best place we have. I always joke that this, I would never want to do this work in the Middle East, certainly. I'd be in jail or anywhere else, and I don't mean majority, the India, anywhere else, frankly. This is the only nation. I know it's got flaws. I know we have many flaws, but it's the best we've got, and it's the best chance we have at success. So I ask you to join me tonight in planting your trees. I ask you to join tonight in please supporting MPAC. Thank you.